I'm going to focus in on my particular part of the world, which is about resistance. Um, and I think we can think about uh, MI, MI's place in terms of um, uh, process research and navigating important process markers um, of ambivalence and resistance. And so it's a slightly different way of thinking about MI, but I think about MI not necessarily even as a whole model in and of itself, although it's fabulous and it's evolving and so on. But um, I think the research increasingly is supporting that MI is a really nice solution to a very particular set of problems. And that and these turn out to be very pernicious problems uh, that can really poison the therapy if not managed well. And those are the problems of ambivalence or counter change talk, as I'm going to show you and talk about, um, and resistance or opposition, failure to collaborate. And so MI actually, interestingly, is one solution to that problem. Um, and that's the one I'll tell you about today. Uh, but these also, I think there's other research labs talking about alliance ruptures, right? And essentially what you're going to see, what we're going to talk about in terms of resistance, what I study, essentially alliance rupture is just another name for that. And so MI is one way of handling alliance ruptures, but there's other models as well, saffron and murins and, and others. So it's, uh, it's an interesting time, but we're all kind of focusing in on this is, these are particular important empirically supported process markers that demand a particular type of response. Okay, okay so off we go. Uh, so I'm just going to really hit the highlights of what, uh, of what MI is before um, tuning in a bit more to resistance and some of the research um, uh, coming out of our lab in particular and more widely in the area of, of resistance. Okay, so MI, this is the definition offered by Miller and Rolnick uh, that comes out of the second edition of the MI book. There's three editions now. Uh, the second edition is my favorite, but for reasons which will go undisclosed, we don't have time to get into that. Um, but essentially, uh, this definition comes from the second edition, uh, and it says MI is a person-centered directive method for enhancing intrinsic motivation for change by exploring and resolving ambivalence. So just to draw your attention to a few aspects of that definition. So it's person-centered, so it's Rogerian, it's Rogers, and there's debate about how much it actually is Rogers. I don't know that anybody's actually done the study comparing full-on client-centered to MI. It would be very interesting study. As I look at Watch Rogers tape, actually, especially the one with Gloria, he's talking about ambivalence. So when he's following what's alive, He's going, there's a part of you and another part of you, and doing these fancy things that we talk about in MI. So it's debatable how much it actually is Rogers, uh, but, it, but it's very much foundationally Rogers. And actually, client-centered has a real resurgence now, doesn't it? Instead of EFT, emotion-focused therapy, MI, these are all sort of offshoots of... Uh, client-centered uh, sorts of methods, so they're having a real resurgence. So it's client-centered yet directive. That's an interesting sort of challenge, isn't it? And there's debate about, it's sort of both, you know? It walks this strange dialectic where it's directive and non-directive um, almost at the same time or certainly moving between those two skill sets uh, to assist people, and I would argue you need both of those skill sets. Uh, to assist people, and often people have been less well trained in the Rogerian uh, skill set, and especially folks like myself who come from a more directive background. I'm really good at the directive part, but less was less good at the non-directive part. So you can think about it as needing complementary skill sets. So there's debate about how MI is directive, but on a basic level, um, if you think about client-centered is what would you like to talk about what's on your mind? MI is tell me about your conflicted feelings about change. Okay, so it's sort of focal at the bare minimum. And then there's debate about how else it's directive around change talk and so on. Um, but essentially that's the bottom line. So for enhancing intrinsic motivation. So there's a recognition in MI that motivation always comes from within. It can never be supplied from without. You can't, you don't stop smoking because somebody else wants you to, right? Ultimately, or stop drinking or whatever, you don't change anything unless you yourself have wrestled with it, right? And that I want to, but what are the barriers? And going back and forth, sometimes for years on that process. And I think in MI, we might be able to accelerate that process uh, through having more systems systematic process tools to facilitate uh, resolution uh, in a more efficient way, perhaps. But we recognize I can never tell you what to do, ever. So I can never coerce you. Coercion actually doesn't exist. We try. I may want you to stop drinking or to be less depressed or whatever it is, but it's ultimately your decision. Right? Easy said, but very difficult uh, to actually enact. 
uh, by exploring and resolving ambivalence. So um, essentially it's I want to, I don't want to. It's conflicted feelings about change. Okay, so ambivalence, I mean, here's, here's a real um, yeah, no-brainer. Um, not everybody is motivated for change. Even those people who darken your door and who claim very, I used to get these referrals. I worked in lots of different settings, lots of different hospitals. Um, and, uh, and I used to get these referrals, patient highly motivated for change. And then I'd meet the person. <laughs> think, ah, I'm not so sure. Just because somebody says one or two things about wanting to be less X or more Y doesn't mean they're ready to sell the farm uh, and do everything that's required for change. People are conflicted and just recognizing that it's complex is helpful. That there's two sides or two voices or that there's a kind of competition or a conflict or a battle going on. Okay, so while many treatments are effective, a substantial minority of clients with a given problem are unwilling to engage with more action-oriented treatments or comply reluctantly with little success. Uh, and just to, to give you one example, there's been a recent survey of practitioner-identified obstacles to implementing empirically supported treatments for panic and I think GAD and a number of other problems. Um, essentially, what, what they did in these surveys was they said, we've developed all these beautiful treatments, now why aren't you out in the community using them? And when they asked people, they said, well, because a lot of people aren't actually motivated to use them. They are a particular type of treatment, like panic control treatment is an action-oriented treatment. So if people are at that stage, fabulous, it's going to work beautifully. But then you're going to try to apply that to people that are not at that stage, and it's going to fall apart, right? So you need a different set of skills there. Okay, well, me ambivalent, well, yes and no. <laughs> All right. So um, ambivalence derives from the Latin ambi, meaning on both sides, and valencia are vigor, strong positions in opposition. There's like a war in my head. I want to, I don't want to. I should, but I can't. Uh, uh, worry is a big domain that I work in, uh, GAD. Uh, and there's positive and negative aspects to worry, right? So lots of people come in, I worry too much, it's ruining my life, I want to get rid of it. But yet when we ask, a very wonderful question actually, even if you don't ask it in this form is, what's good about worrying, not taking your medication, drinking, staying in that abusive relationship, you know, whatever it is, right? And then what's bad about not doing that? What's bad about leaving that relationship? not worrying anymore, right? And you get some very interesting answers and often very surprising answers. It's sort of a neat question, actually, that kind of catches people off guard in a way. You know, it's sort of, it's sort of unusual, right? You, if you go into your GP and you smoke, you don't expect your GP to say, what do you like about smoking? Right. What? Did I walk into the wrong office here or something? Right, and so essentially that is it. It's exploring, we, we're, as therapists, we're good at exploring the change part, the change talk part, right? The part of the person that comes into treatment, that it's a problem, they want to change. Often the, your, the, real, the real challenge is exploring the other side, right? The barrier, the part of the person that gets in the way, the part of the person that attacks them in the middle of the night when they go to you know, not cut or whatever it is and talks them into actually doing it, right? And so you want to be able to elaborate both of those and lay it out for the client so that the client can decide um, what is in their best interest instead of you trumpeting in and prematurely as well, cutting is bad, we're going to get rid of that, right? So, so you really want to be able to explore that fully. Okay, so ambivalence, uh, one of the reasons I really like it as a topic is because it's, it's just ever present, right? How many people even sitting here can think about at least one thing they're ambivalent about? Hello, right, you're normal, congratulations, good. <laughs> right, so when you're in clinical practice, it takes you about five minutes to run into this. Well, I really should, but da 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 da, right? And so getting good at hearing that, how people talk about change is very important. Okay, so on and on um, for examples of that. So change is hard and people's views on change are not one-sided, they're actually um, complex. And uh, my, the late Mike Mahoney did some beautiful writing on change. He actually said, we're conservative creatures that don't like change. We like order and predictability and, and uh, being comfort, and comfort, right. So we're, it, actually, when you realize all the forces are, that are wiring us to hate the unfamiliar, <laughs> it's actually kind of miraculous that anybody changes at all because they're very <laughs> potent. For, I mean, the devil you know, right? Right, it may not be great, but at least if I, le if I left him, uh-oh, you know, I might get somebody worse, or then I'd have to be alone, or there's often fear there that, of change that is really potent and valuable to explore. 
Okay, so basic principles of MI. Uh, again, this is from the second edition. I think it's changed in the third, but this is still my favorite. All right, expressing empathy, so essentially listening. Um, I think, you know, I had already said, I think uh, uh, there's these two modes, and I think that's a useful way of thinking. You need two complementary skill sets to work with people. Um, that's, a, that's a sort of dichotomous view, but, it's a, but, it's, but it makes the point that people, are, people are, uh, uh, can be at a sort of stuck stage, right, where, where they failed at change, there's lots of resistance to change, and that's where the MI fits, right? MI is not a solution to everything. MI is a solution to a particular problem, and so it's those more supportive soft skills, reflecting, empathy, um, the, making space, right, exploring fears. It's, uh, those are the skills you need on that side. And then when people are more motivated, when change talk starts to come or they start taking steps, then you need to have more sort of CBT type skills or more directive skills. Um, what, what, how, what, if you were to change this, what steps would you take? What have you already tried? What might you try, etc.? So there are two different modes. And the idea is you need both skill sets and you need to move fluidly in between those skill sets depending on the context. So one thing about MI is that it's an inherently responsive model. So if you think about driving, for example, as a metaphor, right? You have a gas and a brake, right? And you need them both. And, and you use them to move fluidly in response to the changing context. You don't always want to have your foot on the gas and you don't always want to have your foot on the brake, right? You want to be able to read What's going on? Where is this person? You know, where are they more motivated, less motivated? And then apply the interventions, the skills that match that particular stage. Okay. Um, the second principle is rolling with resistance. But for my money, that is the principle. Period, full stop. MI is brilliant in a way because it gives you a strategy for managing an incredibly pernicious problem of resi that put most clinicians on their knees, right? Arguing with people, not getting anywhere, getting frustrated, feeling like a broken record, all of those things, right? Yes, we've all been there, right? And so MI offers you a different way of, uh, of being with that person, and that turns out to be incredibly important. So it's sort of, um, one person in a workshop actually once said to me, if I'm understanding right, MI is intellectually very simple, because Miller and Rolnick said, you have resistance, do these five things, right? Easy. Here it's the five reframe, re reflect, etc. Um, in intellectually very easy, but practically extremely difficult. And I said, yes, that's absolutely correct. So it's nice because it is intellectually easy, but it requires a lot of practice, um, especially trying to get at the spirit of MI, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay, <coughs> developing discrepancy. So rolling with resistance just means getting alongside. And we'll uh, hopefully, if you stay for the workshop, we'll, we'll see, we'll practice some of that and we'll see what that looks like more. Uh, developing discrepancy, so between pros and cons, this voice, that voice, uh, between valued directions and current behaviors, how's your parenting when you've been drinking, you know, these kinds of things. So you're going here, but yet your anxiety tells you to stay there. What do you make of that, right? So helping people to wrestle with those things and supporting self-efficacy. And I think the data more and more, one interpretation that we have of what's happening, where the data is leading about where MI fits, um, is that it really is a way of enhancing agency. Uh, self-efficacy, right, because MI is much more an evocative kind of model. But for me, MI is about the management of resistance, also a specific problem versus being a whole model. So we often talk about the spirit of MI, and this is how Miller and Rolnick define the spirit. It's evocative versus prescriptive, so it's drawing out. What are your ideas about this? So it's constantly looking to the client and drawing out. Um, it's collaborative, so it avoids the expert trap. But as in Rogerian model, the client is the expert. You know yourself best. What do you think kind of idea? Um, and it's respecting autonomy. So it's suppressing the writing reflex, as Miller and Rolnick call it. So often we have fix-it brain, call it. Or we see a problem and we instantly, okay, well, you should be assertive. You should do all. And that's what we think to be helpful. But in fact, in MI, you actually want to be aware of that and actually... Um, suppress that in favor of the client becoming an expert on themselves and becoming an authority on themselves. Okay, so this is a good example of an evocative question. Why do you think you cross the road? <laughs> you should never be working harder than your client. It's a good principle, right? So if your client isn't sweating enough, you're in trouble. And if you're doing all the sweating, uh -uh. don't be your client's frontal lobes. Make them work. Right, right. They'll, they'll be better off for it. Right, and you'll, you'll be better off for it as well. Okay, so um, training in MI. 
Uh, it's not as easy as it looks. So uh, there's actually, it's amazing how little research there is on training in our field. It's absolutely, I, I, some of you have seen the flyer and hopefully have signed up for the workshop. I'm getting more interested in the topic of training. How do we train good clinicians? <laughs> Um, but uh, in MI, there actually has been some research, and what they found systematically on training, what they found is that a workshop is typically not enough, that people need more practice, they need feedback. Um, and it's very challenging to shift between, I talk about these two modes so easily, but it's actually incredibly challenging to shift seamlessly between those two, and it requires a lot of practice. But the data certainly suggests that it's worth the effort. Okay, so I'm going to zero in just a little bit on uh, my corner of the world, which is on resistance in particular. So what we've learned is that resistance is critical and more critical than we thought. Okay, so of all the concepts in MI, it's almost like uh, the stuff that we've done is taking like a laser beam to MI and seeing what is it in this big model that's actually important, right? And so we've carved out a corner of the world on resistance and, our, and have developed a coding system and done a lot of research in the last decade or more looking at that, some of which I'll share with you. So what does it look like? Uh, this is just some sampling, but yes, but, I can't, I won't. Arguing, disagreeing, debating, disqualifying, I don't know. There's about five different ways of saying I don't know, actually, but I don't know is a big one. Passivity, silence, withdrawal, ignoring, not responding, <coughs> sidetracking, interrupting, lateness, no-shows, homework, non-compliance, and we could probably add more to the list, okay? Fascinating phenomena, absolutely riveting. So resistance um, is a very critical process marker. So it's a one of the things that has really impressed us. You know, when we first set out on this journey to measure resistance uh, in coded sessions, or in sessions through coding, I, I honestly did not, I was floored in retrospect about how much variance this accounts for. It's actually an incredibly rare phenomena, believe it or not. Most of the time people are wanting to get along. Most of the time people are cooperating. We're not arguing all the time, you know, which is, which is what's fascinating about it. So even though it's sort of like on average less than 5% of all utterances um, on average, it accounts for 30% of the variance in terms of outcome. So the more of these little episodes, these little debates, you know, that these arguing back and forth, you doing all the work, client, you know, headbutting each other, um, the more of that you get, the worse the outcome, even up to one year post-treatment, okay? And that's just not our lab saying it, it's Miller's lab saying the more you confront somebody with addictions, the worse they're drinking one year later. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, so, so it's actually pretty, pretty um, incredible how much variance it actually accounts for. Okay. Uh, all right, so then I'll tell you about um, one particular study that stands out for me in terms of the work that we've done. So this is a study by one of my um, dissertation students uh, a couple of years back, and she, I'm going to tell you also uh, about a trial uh, that we did uh, comparing CBT alone to MICBT for severe GAD. So she took some of the data from the CBT alone group in this trial. Uh, so these were therapists who were actually untrained in MI. Actually, they were selected because they weren't trained in MI, okay? Um, and she wanted to ask the question, is natural variation in uh, being empathic in response to resistance, being more MI-like in response to resistance. Is natural variation to that, does that actually matter? So she went through in the CBT alone therapist tapes um, uh, with their clients and she found disagreement episodes. I didn't like the homework, I didn't do the <laughs> muscle relaxation, I don't like the direction we're headed, da 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 da, I disagree you know, about something. She painstakingly found those. And then she had coders um, code those um, for MI adherence, even though these were untrained therapists, but just natural variations. And we honestly found she would find, thought we find, would find nothing, because the, on a one to five scale, they barely got above three. So as I said, a lot of people aren't trained in these specific skills of empathy. And as you will see, it's a very specific and difficult skill set. It's not, it's often just passively thrown away as nothing, but it's one of those things. I mean, when I learned it, I realized I'd spent about a decade not listening at all. Right, that it's a very particular skill set that's very, very difficult. Uh, so she found variation maybe one to three on that five point scale. So we thought, oh, limited variance, not gonna find anything. Whopping results. So therapists that were even slightly better in naturally when somebody disagreed, rolling over and say, tell me more about that. Oh, I see, I hear. Right, say, tell me more about that, um, had whoppingly better outcomes to a large effect than those therapists who automatically dug in um, and, and started controlling and saying, well, you want to do the homework because of these 65 reasons, right? And, and went the control route, right? It's essentially control versus rolling over. But the other interesting thing about that study 
uh, is that she then also compared um, the, the timing of empathy. So then she took random parts of a session with these same therapists and she had them coded for MI adherence. So is MI adherence generally the thing, being more empathic generally? Or is it at the specific moment of resistance? And what she found was that MI adherence generally was unrelated to outcomes. So being empathic is nice, whatever, but MI adherence at the moment of disagreement was 10 times more impactful in terms of outcome. So, so this suggests to us it's not this generic, oh, go be Rogers all day long, but rather being Rogers, doing the right thing at the right time um, can be very impactful. And that's where gleanings from process research can be very, very helpful. So we can go in and uncover patterns and specific maneuvers you know, that, that between clients and therapists that are really accounting for outcomes as opposed to the things we think are. There's two kinds of resistance. One is resistance in my head. I'm ambivalent. Should I leave him? Should I go? Should I stay? Right? That's me. I walk in the door with that. And that's the, what we want to be working on. Tell me about your conflicted feelings about X, okay? Um, and being able to hear that. The other kind is when that turns toxic. And that is that we end up acting out the resistance between you and I. You take a certain position I can't change and I try to persuade you that you can. So here's a critical question to ask yourself. Who's making the arguments for change? The client or the therapist? The therapist. Okay, so that's just a quick and dirty, if you're working too hard, if you're, right, it should be the client that's making the change talk, not the therapist, okay? And so that's in a nutshell kind of what's happening. And I mean, let's not rag on the therapist too much because we've all been there, but this is also, I think one of the things about this, resistance is such a fascinating phenomena because you can get these beautifully empathic therapists that all of a sudden sink you know into these highly coercive zero empathy kind of people and I think it's because resistance is like a vortex it's like a hurricane you get drawn into and I think it's something that's automatic it's then there's been studies on this somebody comes in and says I don't want to quit smoking I love smoking oh tell me why you want to quit smoking right it's sort of a natural response and I think especially us as helpers it's a natural vortex we get drawn into and so in Increasingly, I'm thinking more, it's more about recognizing that automaticity that we get sucked in and when we all do it, that's why I'm in this field is because I got sucked in and more times than I care to mention here, I was that therapist. Um, and so then you want to then step back and go, how can I be different? But that's a real process of awareness and practice to get there. So one of the interesting things, just to kind of summarize that piece, and we do have time, so it's fine. Um, is uh, Miller and Rolnick in the first edition of MI, now like 20 years later, I think it was, well, more than 20 years, it was 91 when they came out with the first edition of MI. And in that, they had a fifth <laughs> principle that they ended up taking out, but now the research says they never should have. And that fifth principle was avoid argument. Right. So all these other lovely things, enhance agency, roll with, you know, all these things, but avoid argument. Right. Argument we've discovered through our research, even a little bit is, is very bad. It's kind of, I think about it like paint, you know, you get this beautiful white can of paint and then they just put in one drop of yellow and the whole thing <laughs> changes. And that's a little, if you even think about arguments you've had with people, right, you can think about all of a sudden you really hate this person and you, you know, like you feel really passionately about it. It's a fascinating phenomenon in terms of what it does to relationships and what it does to the people in those relationships. So it's fascinating to study. Okay, but that's a sort of it in a nutshell, avoid argument. So I was just going to, um, uh, spend the last five minutes or so uh, talking a little bit more about sort of where MI fits within CBT because that's sort of my domain. I have a background in CBT. I came to MI later in my career, a decade or more into my career because of motivational problems. I could see that that, that CBT was not well addressing motivational problems. Um, uh, and so I've been thinking a lot and doing a lot of research and my studies are about the integration of MI with CBT and how that fits. So just to go over some of the advantages of that in terms of what we've learned about where it fits within CBT. So one is uh, it enhances engagement in treatment and long-term outcomes, which is a very lovely benefit. Um, so I'm just going to cite um, our study that we did, the third RCT that we did, which was published in 2016, which I think was by far the best. 
Um, and it was a really good study, if I do say so myself. So I think we can learn a lot. So with Marty Antony and Michael Constantino, we did a, a, an RCT where we randomized severe GAD, so they had to be worrying on the ceiling lots of comorbidity, everything, uh, to c straight CBT, 15 sessions, or MI uh, plus CBT, meaning MI for the first four sessions. And then the real, I think, power of the design was the integration in the last 11, so that therapists could move seamlessly between, de in, depending on markers of ambivalence and resistance, they could move back in to MI. And then when change talk was present, they could move more into CBT and move fluidly between those two, which I think was the real power of the design. Um, and the most important part of that study was that we nested therapists and supervisors. So allegiance effects, knowing how you want something to turn out, accounts for about 70% of the variance in outcome trials. It's, it's stunning. We don't pay enough attention to that, but it's stunning. So we need to be able to do a real head-to-head -head trial where, where we don't hamper the control group. So in this case, CBT. So we had Marty Antony, and, and postdocs training and supervising those therapists. Those therapists never saw the MICBT clients, and I trained and supervised the MICBT therapists. And it was a real race. Like Marty really, and the therapist really wanted Marty to beat me. Like it was, it was a lot of fun actually. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say it was a lot of fun. It was a little gut wrenching, a lot of it. But not, nevertheless, it was like Marty and I both going head to head, seeing if we're doing our very best in terms of the treatments, and let's see what happens. Let's let sort of science decide. And what we found um, was, oh great, so now my slides are up. Here's what we found. So uh, uh, post-treatment, meaning the bar on the, on the left-hand side, uh, both treatments were highly effective and equal. Right, to the, for the 15 sessions. It's very hard to beat an effective treatment. It's very hard to beat a credible treatment, right? Going head to head is very much a losing game in, in psychotherapy research. It's very hard to beat a good treatment. So both of them were uh, equal and effective, but with the follow up was the fascinating part. And so here you can see in the green bar, the CBT sort of maintained their gains, which is consistent, but the MICBT continued to improve over time at six months and one year follow up. Here it is diagnostically. So this this is the percentage blind diagnosticians uh, who we said, does this person still have GAD or not? You tell me. You've never met him before, but you tell me. You tell us. Um, and what we see here is exactly the same thing, that the number of people who lose the diagnosis in the MICBT goes up over time and to a whopping 69 percent, so that almost 70 percent at one year could no longer be said to have the diagnosis of GAD. And here you see the difference between treatments such that at one year the odds of recovery was five and a half times higher if at one year post-treatment if you got MI CBT versus CBT alone. Um, so we thought that was pretty neat and pretty compelling. I'm going to show you another study that kind of explains some of that. But the most important thing uh, about MI, in case it's not already clear, is that it reduces resistance. So we found, in terms of mediator studies, we said, what the heck is going on? Is it the difference in empathy? Is it the difference in alliance? Like, what's the difference here? You know, what's going on? Turns out, in a nutshell, this is a complicated slide, but essentially just means it was resistance. It was 86% of the reason that, uh, that the MICBT group did better in the long run was that they were arguing less. Uh, I'll just skip over that one because just, just to quickly say there, and this is an alliance rupture study, uh, but essentially the frequency of alliance ruptures was far less. It was sort of half in the MICBT and they were more likely to recover from them and less likely to be repeated. So it, in the CBT it was like if there's an alliance rupture, it's like an unhealed injury that keeps getting re-wounded, right? You, and this is what we see on tapes, is you see them, the resistance episode, and then they switch topics. Well, let's talk about something else, is often what happens. And then, of course, it doesn't go away, so it just comes up at another time. Okay. Uh, I won't go over that one for the sake of time, but, but I wanted to show you this one. So um, again, it's wrong to think everybody needs MI and now we should all be doing MI and it's the new panacea. You know, everybody drop what you're doing and everybody do MI. Um, but it's a, what, where it does fit again is this more specific place where it's especially helpful for some folks, right? And who should it be helpful for? Those who are 
more ambivalent or conflicted, right? And that's exactly what we find. So here is from the same data set. Uh, this is another student of mine who looked at um, uh, clients who are high in what we call counter change talk. So those people in session one who had more yes, but, uh, I can't, um, but, you know, I, I worry helps me in these various ways and so on. People that uttered more arguments in favor of not changing, right? So on the bottom, you can see that as that number goes up, so that as you are more conflicted, you see the separation of treatments becomes much larger. So that um, by the end of by the end of treatment, you're much less you're you're more likely to have much less worry if you received MICBT if you were highly ambivalent to begin with. Whereas the high ambivalent people that got CBT alone did less well. In other words, thinking back to some of those effects I showed you earlier. If we had only, if we could somehow siphon off the people that just were ambivalent, our effects would have been whopping. Does that make sense? Okay, but because we randomly polling people, we randomly get people that were highly motivated too, and they could have either. And that's what this shows. So on the left-hand side, in fact, there's a slight advantage of CBT alone for those people that are the most motivated. For those people that had the least counter change talk, they actually do slightly better uh, if they got CBT alone, which really fits with Larry Butler's work and other people's work. It's that matching idea, right? You've got to see where people are at. You can't just go in with a one size fits all, but you've got to see where you're at. And where you're at can change and can fluctuate. And so you have to be prepared to do that dance of moving. If somebody suddenly becomes stuck, then you've got to move to more reflective positions. OK, and then the final thing is uh, enhances agency. And then I'll stop. We'll take some questions. Um, uh, right, so this is a, a qualitative study, again, by one of my students uh, that looked at client post-treatment accounts <laughs> of their experiences in treatment based on this study. Um, and essentially, in a nutshell, what happened was, in the qualitative accounts, tell us about your experiences of treatment, essentially, right? What surprised you, what didn't, how did you find it, et cetera? There, was, there were ca whole categories that emerged for the MICBT group that didn't emerge for the CBT alone group. And those were categories involving agency. Um, and just to show you a couple of quotes from the people in the MICBT about their experiences. So for example, what came was an inner sense of confidence was one of one, one participant's um, account. This was the first therapy where I felt during and afterwards that I could handle things on my own rather than needing a therapist. Not that I wouldn't benefit from having a therapist, but that before, uh, when I was in therapy, it was like I really needed that therapist. Like I needed a therapist to be able to keep things going in my life, like stressors. I couldn't deal with them completely on my own. So this therapy enabled me to be more self-sufficient and self-soothing and managing the worry in a way that was great. I mean, I guess that was surprising. And then the second one, I ran the show, was sort of a, a category that came up. Here's one example. I thought maybe the therapist would be more controlling, as in where we go, what we do, what we address, and things like that. And that wasn't the case, which was great. I probably should say, I kind of ran the show. Almost like they're kind of going, shh, don't tell anybody. I really ran the show. Right. So you can see how that fits with this notion that we're developing, that really what's going on here is when you manage these impasses well, uh, and maybe am I more generally, but especially when you manage the impasses well, you enhance a person's agency and self-efficacy. So that's in a nutshell what we think is happening. OK, so I'll stop there, and then we'll take a few questions. And if, if we don't have a lot of questions, I can show you, to try to show you that clip earlier, but we'll see how that works. Yes, please, Vince. Um, a, a few slides back where you had the, uh, the MICB. This, this one? one? Um, were you able to detect if you were to like lay out um, Prochaska stages of change of the contemplation ladder on the x-axis? Right. Where do we switch in that? Uh, spectrum from right. CBT alone to yeah. Right, right, yeah. So we didn't think of it that way, but that's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah, in terms of Prochaska's model, is an excellent conceptual model to think about for this. He also very much talks about matching at different stages and so on. In MI, for me, where MI fits even in terms of that model is it's a contemplation therapy. You could say it might help with pre-contemplation too, maybe, but you have to be ambivalent. Right, and that's usually what happens. That's usually no problem because people come in usually pretty ambivalent, right, about making changes. Part of them wants to, but part of them is afraid to. So it's, it's more about co the contemplation uh, folks. But in terms of how to use that clinically, 
Right, that's also a very interesting thing. Um, but when you're hearing more, it, it, what we found actually is that counter change talk is more important than change talk. So at least in our studies, there's a lot, whoops, a lot of literature out there in addictions and other fields. Other people are finding that as well. That, um, and I think, so, so change talk in a way is kind of a throwaway sometimes. It's easy, right? Counter change talk saying, well, I really don't think this is going to help me, um, is a lot harder for people to utter. And so therefore it can be more valid, I think. But in any case, what we found in all of our studies is that change talk predicts next to nothing and it's all about counter change talk. So when you hear some Somebody saying yes but and here's the other argument arguing from that position of fear and I don't want to change pay attention that is incredibly important and you want to hear more about that because change talk is more cheap and throwaway but then I would say my model of MI and what happens is that as you get good at making space for that there's almost like an emergent process that lets like self-confrontation as I hear myself talk this is incredibly um, common as I hear myself talk and I really hear somebody amplifying that voice, I start to object to myself. I start to say, well, wait a minute, that's a, a sense of control? I, I don't know, I worry a lot, but I don't feel in control. And that, that's change talk, you see? And then, then you want to really perk your ears up to that when it emerges and say, say more about that. Right, and amplify it that way. But so it's more of a dichotomous rather than a multi-stage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions? Yes, please. I've heard that for clients who are highly ambivalent, that actually talking about both sides of, of change, like right. the pros and the cons, can, can further reinforce that ambivalence. Great question. Great question. Okay, so so you've just hit on the debate that I <laughs> right you've hit beautifully in a nutshell. Right. So so and I think we need process research to to answer this question. But yeah, essentially there are two different theories of MI. One the the more conventional theory uh, by Mi the Miller and the MI group is much more about you'll see a lot more about change talk and actually pulling for change talk and and amplifying change talk preferentially looking at change talk, right? And they would argue that looking at counter change talk is actually counterproductive, actually makes people worse. We haven't found that <laughs> um, because the other model is that it's a conflict and that there's warring sides. And just like in a, let's say, a couple's conflict, right? You don't just want to hear one side, the side you like or the good side. For me, for my money, there's a danger in becoming a little too attached to the change talks. Not just me, but other people as well. So there's a bit of a debate happening, right? Should you look at both sides and do that? So think of it as a conflict resolution, right? Or should you preferentially pull change talk? We use Dr. Phil a lot for coding, uh, training new coders, because he's very easy to code. The, the phenomenon that's usually incredibly rare with him happens in about five seconds by watching anything. So anybody who's watched Dr. Phil will know what I mean, right? He's often telling you what he thinks, and that kind of directive style actually is more, much more likely to elicit ambivalence. That's also why I study MI within CBT, because of that directive style is much more likely to run into that phenomenon of resistance. All right, thank you very much.